Thank you so much for tuning in to Encounter AZ's podcast. We are believing that God is going to use this ministry to change your life. Now enjoy the message. What's God's will? You know, I get a question almost more than any question from people. How do you know, how do I know what God's will is for my life? And so I've been um, wanting to teach about that for a while. So I have some thoughts I want to share to you um, about that this morning. The title of my message, if you're taking notes, is Finding God's Will. Kind of looks like Finding Dory. Uh, we, did, we did rip it off, okay? Just don't tell Disney. Um, but it's kind of hard to find God's will sometimes. It's kind of confusing. And so I want to give you some thoughts and to make it a little simpler for you. I think we make it more complicated than it is a lot of times. Um, so I want to talk to you about God's will this morning. One thing I have noticed if you're married in here, maybe you can um, share my struggle because the struggle is real with marriage in this aspect. When you get married, you never again agree on one thing. Amen. No, I mean you agree on a lot of things, but there's one thing you don't agree on. Hopefully you agree on a lot of things. Um, you, I realized the moment I got married was the day I would never again agree on where to eat. I don't know if you guys have the same struggle as me. But let me tell you how the conversations go when my wife and I are deciding if we're going to go out to eat, where we're going to eat, okay? It goes something like this. Hey, Jen, what do you want to eat? Oh, I don't care. I'll eat anything. You decide. I don't care. Anything. Absolutely. I'm just hungry. Anything. All right. How about let's go get some pizza? No, not pizza, okay? Not pizza. I had pizza last Tuesday, okay? Anything else, really. Anything else. Okay. How about we'll go get a burger? Oh, burgers again? Are you serious? Anything, anything you want. No, not anything. It is a struggle to find out. We never know where to go. Am I the only one who struggles with this? Any other men can say amen that they struggle with it? All right. Thank goodness. I'm not alone. I'm preaching to the right crowd. But many people kind of live their life looking for God's will the same way. Brent, I don't know where to go. Like, I want to do God's will. I want to know I'm walking in God's will, but I have no idea what that is. I'll never figure out where to go. And I don't think God desires for us to live that way. But the truth is, finding God's will is not like Dora the Explorer. There is no map, okay, that goes along with it. I have kids, so stay with me. I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. Um, but there's no map that goes along with it, so we end up with these questions, like, young people always ask me, Brent, where should I go to college? Like, where does God want me to go to college? Or should I leave this job and start another job? Or what do I do when I'm looking for a mate? Or even what do I do when my friend steals my boyfriend or girlfriend? The first thing you do is say swipe or no swiping, okay? Um, but the truth is, finding God's will, is it seems difficult sometimes. So I want to explain to you that this morning that there are two types of God's will. There's his revealed will and his concealed will. And what I mean by that, I'll lay it all out, but the revealed will of God is the word of God. Okay, when we read the scriptures, we have the revealed will of God for every believer. Do, should I help people, Brent? Well, the word of God says you should help people. You should love even your enemies, so go ahead and do that. That's the revealed will of God. So we know that, but so often I, I meet people who are trying to find out the concealed will of God, but they never even started living and fulfilling the revealed will of God. And so God desires for us to fulfill his revealed will. If we don't listen to what he's already told us, how can we discern what he hasn't told us? How can I discern that what the concealed will means is his personal will for my life? Like, who should I marry? Where should I, where should I live? Like, what should, I, should I be in ministry? What should I do for a job? This is the concealed will of God for my life, and we all have that. And that is what most people want to know. But if we don't listen to his revealed will, how can we discern his concealed will? It's like saying, Brent, can you teach me how to slam dunk? I don't slam dunk myself, so probably not. But I would probably say, well, can you do a layup? And they'd say, well, no. Well, if you can't do a layup, how can you expect to slam dunk? You see, there's some fundamental things that you got to learn first. got to crawl before you can walk. When we want to understand what the concealed will of God is for our life. We first must start by understanding his revealed will for our lives. It's the fundamentals. It's the small things. It's what we're doing in our day-to-day -day life to fulfill the revealed will of God that will lead us down a path to discover the concealed will of God for our lives. I've heard it said that it's what happens in empty gyms that fills up arenas. It's because the small things count. 
It's what we do. It's the fundamentals. It's public victory that comes through private obedience. Because God's will will never take you where your character can't sustain you. Or you'll lose it real quick. What I mean by that is, Brent, I'm supposed to be preaching. Well, you're still, you're still young and you still have a lot of things that God wants to deal with. If I gave somebody a mic the day that they were called to preach, odds are their character could not sustain them. God has a process that he wants to help them to grow as they continue to obey the revealed will of God and grow and mature in their faith until they get to a place where God has taken them through the process and their character can carry what his will is. Does that make sense? God's revealed will, the word of God, obedience to the word of God, it comes in three stages. It's always, sometimes, and never. Okay? There's three different types of things to look at when you look at God's word. There's certain things that are always okay for us to do, right? I mean, it's always okay for us to love people, right? I mean, that's kind of cheesy, but let's be honest. There's things that are always okay. There's things in the Word of God, in obedience to God, that are sometimes okay. If you do them in moderation, like eating, that's my biggest struggle, um, but I luckily have a fast metabolism, praise God, but that's still yet a struggle. There's some things that are always, there's some things that are sometimes that must be done in moderation, and then the Word of God gives us some things that are never that God has put boundaries in our life to protect us from things on the other side, not because he wants to keep things from us, but because he loves us and he knows that those things, what those things bring into our life. But I want to help you today to navigate God's concealed will when it's not clear. Because let's be honest, sometimes there's no verse to turn to. Like when it has to do with personal things in our life. When you're looking for someone to marry, God, the Bible tells us what to look for. It tells us to look for um, a person who loves Jesus, right? A person who understands um, what it means to be a biblical husband or wife. These things are things that we look for in a spouse because the Bible tells us. But it doesn't tell us blonde or brunette, okay? It doesn't tell us everything. And sometimes, it, to be honest, there's more than one good option, like, the, I have two great jobs presenting themselves to me. Which one does God want me to take? Sometimes there's two great options that there's no verse to turn to. So what do we do in those times when it's confusing and unclear? I believe God wants you to have confidence that you are walking in his will. I don't think he wants us to wonder and say, I don't know, like, I may have messed up. I may have done these things wrong. And I want to share a, script, a couple scriptures with you here from Romans chapter 12 as we... As we begin this this morning and kind of break this down, it should be on the screen, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. There it is. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Another uh, version says, this is your reasonable worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what the will of God is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to notice something about this scripture. It tells us all these things about being a living sacrifice, um, being transformed. And then at the end, it says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. See, it's an outcome. God's will is, is an outcome. See, Paul's saying, live your life now so that the outcome is that you're, live, you're walking in God's will. Um. One thing you can write down, this is tweetable if you want to, if you're taking notes, it says, God's will is more present than future, yet it often remains invisible until it's in the past. See, we're always looking to the future and saying, God, what's your will for my future? I think God's will is more present. What am I doing right now than it is future? And sometimes it's not visible until it's in the past, right? We look back and say, oh, that was God's will. Now I see. See, but we always want to know beforehand. We want to know the big picture. But Paul is saying, live your life so that the will of God is an outcome. It's not something to strive for. So how do we get there? How do we get to the place where we can be able to say, I'm in the will of God. I believe that I'm in the will of God. Verse 1 that we read there, it says, present your life as a living sacrifice. Present your life. That's in the present. That's not in the past. It's not saying someday present your life. That's in the present. So in the present, present your life to God as a present. Okay, that's a lot of presents I just said there. 
Let me slow that down. In the present, present your life to God as a present. That's saying give your life as a living sacrifice to God. It's basically saying, God, here I am. Send me. Use me. My life is yours. It's saying about your life that my life is no longer mine. Every time I walk into a room, I'm on a mission to be used by God. That's what a living sacrifice looks like. God, I, my life is a gift to you. I present my life to you. Verse 2 says, calls, be called out of the world by being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. He's saying, let God's word renew your mind. Let yourself be a living sacrifice. Let God's word renew your mind. This is your reasonable service. This is your reasonable service. When we think of the word reasonable, I always think of money. You know, when we talk about the word reasonable, we usually it involves money. Like, if you go to Starbucks, $6 for a coffee is not reasonable, okay? That's not very reasonable. And counter coffee, very reasonable. It's free, okay? That's very reasonable coffee. If you've ever been to the airport and bought, like, a bagel for $8, unreasonable, okay? It's not reasonable. So why is it saying giving our entire life to God is your reasonable act of service? How is that reasonable, like, let my, bo- my life be a living sacrifice. How is that reasonable? God wants all of us. Is that reasonable? Yes, it is reasonable. Because he gave all of himself to buy you. He gave all of himself for you. And the only reasonable response is to give your life to him. So it is reasonable. And then it says, the outcome of all of that, if we're doing all of that, the outcome is that you may prove the will of God. That you'll prove what the will of God is. That you'll be walking in the will of God. Basically, Paul's saying, you're going to be in the will of God as these things are happening. If you're doing all of these things, then you're going to be in the will of God. Because we've all done that where we've looked back and said, that was the will of God. When, when that person left my life and I was all upset, psh, that was the will of God. You ever done that? Or when I lost that job and I was so stressed and I thought like God had left me or something, now I see that was the will of God because he gave me a better job and that was a bad situation. Anybody else ever had that happen? Is anybody getting anything out of this? I know this is a little different, but I feel like this is important for us to talk about. Um, so how did that happen? How did it happen where you look back and you're like, wow, that was the will of God? You know how it happened? It happened when you weren't paying attention to it and you were just being a sacrifice. You were just living your life for God, and he was working things out for you. Because the will of God is more of a journey than a destination. We all want to see the destination. God, what do you want for my life? Where should I go to college? Where should I work? What should I do with my life? Who should I marry? What do you want me to do for my next job? What's going to happen with my house? We have all of these things that we worry about. We see the destination, but I believe God is saying, just join me on the journey, and I'll take you to the right destination. Instead of worrying. It's a process, and we don't see the proof until it's in the rear view mirror. We don't. Why? Why do you think that is? Because God wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to walk by faith. And we, he want, we want to see the Google map of our whole journey. You know what I mean? I want to see, like, where am I going to make a left? Where am I going to make a right, God? Where am I going to get stressed? Because it, it helped to know beforehand, God, God doesn't see it that way. He sees it as a relationship, not a scavenger hunt. Because if we, if we see it as a scavenger hunt, we're just going to look for a destination. God, what's next? What do I need to find? What do I need to do? And God is saying, just have a relationship with me. Do my revealed will. Grow in your relationship and I will take care of the rest. It's a person to know, not a place to discover. God wants to know you. He wants to grow with you, watch you grow, and and he'll take you to what he has for you, to his will. Proverbs 3, there's a very well-known scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He's saying, in all of your ways, if you're acknowledging him, he's going to direct you into his will. If in everything you're doing, you're acknowledging him, you're going to find yourself in his will because his will cannot be found by seeking it. His will is found by seeking him. And while you're seeking him, you find yourself in his will. And it starts with acknowledging him in all of your ways, and then you find yourself in his will. You ever been snubbed by someone? Like, not acknowledged. Have you ever done this awkward thing? I was thinking about this as I was writing this sermon. Um, where you're, like, walking and someone waves and you think they're waving at you. And you're, like, and then, like, it's someone behind you. And it's so awkward. You're, like, 
Well, yeah, we've all done that, don't lie. But God is just saying, acknowledge me. In everything you do, acknowledge me. In everything you do, do it for me. Never do anything without acknowledging him. And the byproduct is he will direct your path. You're starting a new job or you have a couple jobs, you don't know what to do, if you should leave this job and go to a different job, if you're acknowledging God, he's going to be directing your paths. You see, I wrote this down, while you're busy pedaling, he's doing the steering. While you're busy pedaling, he's doing the steering. Bikes cannot be steered unless there's motion. You ever try and steer a bike when it's not moving? You're going to fall. I don't care how good a balance you have, how good of a bike rider you have, you add motion and then steering becomes possible. It's the same way with the will of God. If I'm moving and I'm doing and I'm growing in my relationship with God, then he can steer and take me to different places. But if I'm not moving, nothing's going to happen. You ever met that guy who like, lives in his mom's basement and uh, says, I'm just looking for the right job, but he never leaves. He just plays video games all the day. That job is not going to happen unless you go out and find it. In the same way in the will of God, God is saying, you just move and do what I've already called you to do in my revealed will and my concealed will will happen as you're acknowledging me. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It takes, it, I, this gives, it was huge for me to realize this because it took a huge burden off of me that I have to like find and make sure I'm doing everything right. All of a sudden it was in God's hands. There's another verse in, or a story in Genesis 24 where this Abraham asked his servant Eleazar to go find his son Isaac a wife. And Eleazar finds his wife Rebekah. But you know what? Eleazar didn't just sit there and pray for her to come. He went out and he looked and he said, God, direct me. And the story actually says, on the way, the Lord led me. On the way, the Lord led me. It's the same with the will of God. As I'm doing the revealed will of God, he's going to lead me into the path that he has for me. As I'm acknowledging him in all of my ways. See, Eleazar didn't just sit, he moved. And he was doing what he already knew to do. And God directed him to Rebekah. And it was the will of God. When you pedal, he can steer. You focus on the growing. You focus on the movement. Focus on the revealed will of God and allow God to steer you into his concealed will. How does he steer? He steers through your thinking. He steers through your thinking. Because we have certain thoughts, but when we live the way he wants us to live, all of a sudden we think the way he wants us to think. When I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and I'm living for God and I'm growing in my relationship with God, I'm saying, God, I just want to be more like you. All of a sudden, my thoughts become his thoughts. The scripture talks about the mind of Christ. As I'm growing in my relationship with God and I'm doing his revealed will and I'm saying, God, I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice to you, all of a sudden, I'm doing his concealed will because my mind begins to be transformed to his mind. And it happens when I present myself to God every day. I say, God, I want to hide your word in my heart. Watch what happens. All of a sudden, his word will start to come out of your heart. His, your thoughts and your heart will begin to be transformed into his thoughts and his heart. Because God has given you people around you right now to influence. God has given you something to do right now around you. You don't, you don't even realize it sometimes. I remember one time I was writing a sermon, and I, I took a walk, you know, I was being very spiritual. I was like on some spirit walk or whatever, I don't know. Um, and I walked over to this hamburger place, and I was sitting outside eating. It's very spiritual. And uh, I was reading my Bible, and I'm eating, and I'm trying to study for a message, and um, this homeless man came over to me, and he said, hey, sir, could you, could you buy me some food? And, and I was being very spiritual, remember? So I was thinking to myself, God, why is this man bothering me? Smite this man, God. I'm trying to prepare a message to reach people, God, and this man is bothering me. How stupid is that? There is people around you all the time that God is trying to reach. Obviously, I bought him food, okay? I'm just telling you that story. (laughs) Let me save that at the end there. But God is giving you people. You just got to open your eyes. God has given you influence right where you are. God has called me to be an evangelist. Brent, great. You're not one right now, but you're an evangelist to the people all around you. Share Jesus with them right now. God has given you people. Do what he's called you to do, and he'll give you a process that will lead you to his revealed will. Commit your ways to God, and your thoughts will line up with his thoughts. 
You see, the things that you dream about and that you, sometimes we think, if I, if I commit to serving God and his will, then I'm not going to be able to do what I wanted to do. Can I tell you, if you have a dream in your heart, the odds are God probably put it there. See, doing God's will and surrendering yourself to his will, we think is a prison sentence sometimes. It is not a prison sentence. It is a permission slip to do everything that he created you to do and called you to do. He's not going to take away any dream that he put in your heart to do in the first place. Committing yourself to God's ways opens up the door for him to show you his, his concealed will. And I promise you, his ways are better than my ways. Whatever plans I had, if they're not God's plans, his plans are much better. There's a man named Augustine. He's a theologian back in the day, and he's from a place called Hippo, you know, just like um, the hungry ones that feed on marbles, okay? You know what I'm talking about. But he said this. He said, love God and then do what you will. Love God and then do whatever you want. Like even sin, Brent? No. If you love God, you're not going to want to sin. Love God and then do what you want. It's a beautiful quote. I love that because I feel like there's, there's three levels of serving God. There's three levels of finding out the will of God. The first level is discover. Maybe some of you here are here this morning and this Christianity thing, this whole religious thing is new to you. And having a relationship is new to you and you're just now discovering what the will of God is, what the revealed will of God is. Like, this is what God wants me to do with my life. Okay, I'm discovering it. That's fine. I don't really want to do it. I'm just discovering it. That's fine. You're you're welcome here. This is this is a place where you can you can belong before you become like Jesus. We this is a home. I don't care if you believe in God or not. We want you to feel welcome here and we want to love you and serve you, okay? I just want to put that out there. But the first level is discover. The second level is do. Like after you've discovered the will of God, there comes a point where some people they they do the will of God, but I don't. I don't really want to, but I do it because I know it's the will of God. Anybody ever been there? You've been in those seasons where you're like, I'm doing it, God. I don't want to, but I'm doing it. And that's okay. God is with us in that struggle. But the last um, area that I want to talk to you about, you have discover, you have do, and then you have desire. And that's where God wants us to be. David wrote about it in the Psalms and said, God, I desire to do your will. God wants us to live a life where our desires match his desires and we actually desire to do his will. And that comes with growing and understanding the revealed will of God. I want to read one more scripture to you and that's Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 here real quick. It should be up on the screen. Sweet. It says, and whatever you do, turn to somebody and say whatever. Why don't you turn to somebody and say whatever. No? All right, fine. I tried. Um. Anybody else seem clueless? I mean, am I too old? All right, whatever. Um, (laughs) Thanks. Um, But it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Basically, what the scripture is saying, whatever you do, do it all in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is. If you're loving God, do what you want as long as it's in the name of Jesus. If you can't do it in the name of Jesus, don't do it, okay? Like, Brent, I want to uh, dance with my clothes off and have people throw money at me. No, don't do that. You can't do that in the name of Jesus, okay? You understand what I'm saying? If you're loving God and you can do it in the name of Jesus, then do it. Um, It's less about what you want to, about what you do and more about why you're doing it. It's less about where you're going and more about who you are becoming. I think God cares more about the way you approach your studies than what college you go to. He cares more about how you approach work than where you work. And if you're dating, stop focusing on finding the right one and start focusing on becoming the right one. You see, it's more about the journey and knowing him than it is about the destination. Is anybody getting anything out of this? All right, good. Basically, what I'm saying to you this morning is follow him and don't worry about it. If you're doing everything you you can and you're in motion and you're focusing on growing and spending your time with him and you're living your life for him, then you don't have to worry about it. If you're acknowledging him in all of your circumstances and all of your choices, then there are no wrong choices. 
Because my mind is becoming the mind of Christ, and his desires are becoming my desires. And so if I'm acknowledging him in my choices, then there are no wrong choices. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. That's what the scripture says. Not only that, I believe you delight yourself in the Lord, and he will instill his desires in your heart. So those desires in your heart are actually God's desires that he has put in your heart if you're acknowledging him and you're living for him. Joshua was getting ready to take all the people of Israel. Moses had died and God had told Joshua, you're going to take the people of Israel into the promised land, into Israel. They'd never been there and, and God said, this is basically how it's going to go. You can go from this point to this point, you can go from this point to this point. He gave them boundaries and parameters, and he basically said, within those boundaries, it's all yours. Do what you want. And I think it's the same way with the will of God. He's given us parameters and boundaries, and he said, if you're living within these boundaries and you're, and you're living for me, then do what you want. Go crazy. If you're acknowledging me in all of your circumstances, your will is going to line up with God's will. If you're within the boundaries and you're you're living for his revealed will, then his concealed will will happen within those boundaries. His revealed will is boundaries. You know that. We've talked about that before. See, we think that God has given us commands, and some people think that you come into church and that's all it's about is just you got to live by these commands or you're not going to belong, or you got to live by these commands to be a Christian. No, God is saying, come to me as you are, and I'll change your desire so that you'll live in these boundaries. But these boundaries are there not to keep us in. We think of them sometimes as these prison walls. Is anybody else a sinner that watches The Walking Dead? I don't. My wife does. You need to pray for her. I'm just kidding. Um, But in that show, the very best season, so I've heard, was season four, where they were stuck in a prison. But you know what's interesting about that prison in that show is that prison was where they wanted to be because what was on the outside could kill them. And so often we think the boundaries and the parameters of God, like that prison, are there to keep us in like a prison wall. But actually those parameters are there to keep zombies out. No, not zombies, but to keep uh, walkers out to keep sin and what sin can do to our lives out because God cares about us. Well, Brent, what are these boundaries? I'm going to give you some practical boundaries, okay, for you to look at your life and say, am I within these boundaries and am I in the will of God? The first one is, am I growing in my relationship with God? If you stay within these boundaries, it will help you to know, God, I want to be in your will. I'm in your will. I believe it because I'm growing in my relationship with you. Second, do I have community around me? Do I have people around me who can encourage me in my relationship with you? The third one is, am I walking in godliness? God, I want to do your will. I desire to do your will because I laid my life down for you as a living sacrifice. Um, Am I growing in giving? And the last one is, am I growing in gratitude? Am I appreciative of God's blessings and of the blessings that other people have given to me? These are some boundaries that you can live your life by because I've noticed when people fall out of the will of God, they've usually violated one of these boundaries. Brett, I, I don't know what happened. I was doing, you know, I was living for God and I just moved and I, I never found a new church when I moved. And I was no longer in community. They violated a boundary that God has set up to help them to live for him. Um, Brent, I don't know what happened. I just... I just fell away from God. Well, have you committed your life to living in godliness? Have you tried and spent time with God and said, God, I want to be more like you. I want to be more godly. No, I haven't done that. We violated a boundary. God desires for us to live for him, and he'll, he'll steer on the way. So maybe you're here this morning, and can I get the worship team to come back up? And maybe you're here this morning, and you, as I'm speaking, you, you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you, or maybe you've just said it to yourself, I've been living outside of the will of God. Maybe there's some things in your life that God's saying you need to lay down. You need to trust me to put this boundary in your life, and that's okay. You know, the will of God is kind of like a navigation system. It's kind of like a GPS in your car. Sometimes I don't believe that lady on my GPS, and I just go where I think I need to go. And then I get lost because the lady knows. But if at any point I decide, you know what, I'm going to start to listen to the voice on the GPS, and I start to do what she tells me, I'm going to get to the same destination. 
And if at any point you decide, God, I'm going to commit my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you in all my ways, and I'm going to turn when you say turn, and I'm going to do and live my life for you, all of a sudden, that destination that he had for you, the will of God, the concealed will of God is still available to you. All you got to do is start to respond to that voice today. It's a beautiful thing. that We have a God who knew us before we were born. He knew every mistake that we'd ever make before he called us to know him and still loved us. I know for me, because I know my own mistakes, that's hard. When I look back, I'm like, man, God, why would you choose me? Why would you love me? And I think we all do that. But we have a God who even then knew that there was a destination that he was going to take me to because at some point in my life, I was going to stop what I was doing and begin to respond to his voice. And then he took me into his concealed will for for my life. As I close, I want to give you a few tips to help you to live in the will of God and to find the concealed will of God for your life. The first one is probably the most obvious. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And that's not some mystical thing where I'm saying, oh, you're going to hear voices. If you tell people you hear voices, they might commit you, okay? But when the closer I get to Jesus, Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. The closer I get to Jesus, the more I sense his leading in my heart. And we all hear from the Holy Spirit. That's the voice that tells you don't do that before you're about to make a big mistake. When we begin to be aware of that voice, when that person at our job offers us an opportunity, but it involves compromising our morals, and that voice says don't do that, it's the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we need to listen to that to stay in God's will. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. The second tip is lean into wise counsel. You want to be in God's will? Find some people, get some people around you who are doing better than you, who are more mature in their relationship with God, and say, what, should, what do you think I should do in my life? What do you see in me? Get some people around you who will tell you that you're dumb sometimes. You need some people that will say, you know what? You're dumb. Don't do that. In love. You know why? Because the people around you, they steer you. The people that you surround yourself with, your life will head in the direction of their life. And so if I'm surrounding myself with good people who are, who are more mature in their relationship with God than me or who are encouraging me in my relationship with God, my life will be steered in that direction. But if I'm surrounding myself with people who are outside of the will of God, you cannot get godly counsel from ungodly people. And my life will be steered in that direction. And it's okay. I'm not saying go and drop every friend who doesn't love Jesus. I'm saying get a good root system of friends, of community people around you. Like get in a community group that we have it here at Encounter and start to get some relationships with people who can steer you in the right direction and who will love you and not judge you and say, I don't think that's a great idea. And here's why. We need wise counsel around us. The third tip. Use all your passports. What I mean by that, let me explain, is there's a story about Moses, and God is calling him to go and speak to to Pharaoh and tell him, I want you to let all my people go. And Moses is like, how can I do that? And God asks him a question. It's one of my favorite questions in Scripture, and it's all he says to Moses is, what's in your hand? And Moses looks down, he's like, a stick? I don't know, a staff? And God says, throw that staff down. And when he throws it down and surrenders it, it turns into a snake. And and God uses it as a sign to Pharaoh. God wants to use what's already in your hand. Use your passports. What I mean by that is, Brent, I don't really have anything in my hand. Yes, you do. What do you use every day? I don't know, chalk? I'm a teacher. Like, I have chalk in my hand. Great. You have a passport into a classroom that I could never be in to show love to young people who are probably hurting. Brent, I'm a a police officer. I I don't know what I can do. You have a passport to talk to hurting and broken people in the back of your car almost every single day. Use your passports and do not forget about the passport of pain because pain will take you into places that you can't go without it. Nobody wants to go through pain. The enemy wants to use your pain to discourage you, but God says he'll use all things together for your good. And none of you, nobody ever wanted to join a group that's called um, children, parents with children who are in heaven. 
But guess what? That's your passport to talk to some people who are going through the same thing that you are. That's a passport for, of pain. Next tip is rethink dead ends. A lot of times when we're looking for the will of God, we try something and it doesn't work and we just get discouraged and we give up on it. Don't give up on dead ends. You need to rethink it. God uses closed doors to show you doors that will be open. There's a story in, in Acts about Paul and he, he desired to go to Asia. And he thought this is God's desire for his life. He's on his way to Asia and all of a sudden God speaks to him and says, I want you to go to Europe. And Paul turned his course and went to Europe. And later on, it seemed like a closed door to Asia. Later on, Paul did get to go to Asia. Sometimes God will give you a closed door and it just means not right now. It doesn't mean that's not his desire for your life. Sometimes God closes a door on, a door on one of our desires and we think, dang, why, why didn't that work out? Maybe it's just not right now. Rethink dead ends. My last tip is do something. Do something right now while you're waiting in that gap between understanding and desiring to do the will of God and knowing the, the concealed will of God. Do something. There's a process. You need to enjoy the process. Have less pressure and more pleasure. There's a story I read as I close about this man, and it was in May of 1980, and this man woke up and said hi to his wife, and his wife said, I got to go to this baby shower, and he said, that's right, and she said, go ahead and do whatever you want today. I, I won't be back till late this afternoon, and he said, all right. So his wife left, and, and he got all his gear on, and he had a Harley, and he got on his Harley, and he decided, I'm going to take the most epic ride around San Francisco that ever happened on my Harley all day, and, and he got on his Harley, and he started to ride, and, and he rode and rode, and he came to this this point in his ride where he started going up this big bridge, and this bridge is so high in San Francisco that cruise ships can go under it. And he's riding up this bridge, he's looking around and seeing the ocean, and it's beautiful, he's having a great time. And as he's looking ahead, all of a sudden he sees a car, and all of a sudden he can't see the car anymore. And then he sees a semi, and all of a sudden it's driving in front of him, and all of a sudden he can't see the semi anymore, and he thought something must be wrong. And he stopped his Harley as fast as he could and put it in the median and looked up, and the bridge had given out. A barge had come through and hit the bridge, and the bridge was out, and nobody knew it. He didn't know what he was going to do. He had nothing. He, he wasn't a police officer. All he could do was he realized, I'm just going to take off my shirt. And he took off his shirt and he started to wave it in the air. And he's waving it and he's waving it. And this is a true story and it's kind of sad, but a school bus came. And he's waving the shirt and the bus driver probably didn't know what he was doing and the bus driver kept going and 25 children and a school bus went over the edge. And he's waving his shirt and waving his shirt and along came a semi-truck and, and the semi-truck thought, this is strange, something must be wrong. And he slammed on his brakes and the semi-truck actually skid to a stop and blocked all the lanes of traffic. That man ended up saving probably hundreds of lives that day just by doing what he could in the moment. Can you ask yourself as we prepared this week, to leave and go back to our jobs tomorrow or whatever we have for this, God has for us this week. Ask yourself, what is in my hand and what can I do right now? God has given you people around you and things and influence that you can do right now. You can do God's will and you can have confidence that you're in God's will right now. It's not a destination, it's a process. Can I have you stand up to your feet with me as we prepare to worship this morning? You know, I think we all need to come to a place where we say, God, I want what you want for my life. I want your revealed will. I want to know it. I want to discover it. I want to do it. And I want to desire it in my heart. Having kids has taught me real quick that there's certain times where one of my children who hasn't played for a toy in years, probably forgot they even had a toy, all of a sudden my other child will be playing with it. And in that moment, the child who hasn't even seen that toy in years will say, I want that toy. 
Can we do that with God's will? Can we say, God, I want to find out what you care about. I want to find out what you're holding on to. I want to find out what's in your hand, and I want to get that in my hand. I want to find out what you're doing, and I want to be involved in that. If you do, if you acknowledge him in all of your ways, I promise you, you will fulfill his calling over your life. And he did not create people without a calling and without a purpose. He created you with a purpose in mind that only you can fulfill. And all it takes is just submitting and saying, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. Will you do that with me this morning as we pray? If you're here this morning and you need to lay something down, your life For the first time, maybe you need to do it again. Or maybe you just need, there's something in your life that God's saying, I've already told you that if you lay that down, I'll take it and I'll change your desires. Will you trust him with that thing this morning? Father, we want to be a living sacrifice, God. Lord, everything that you called us to lay down, we lay down this morning. We believe that there's a purpose for our life, God, and it's going to be unleashed through the process as we just spend more time in relationship with you, God, and not worried about a destination, Lord. Let it grow in our hearts, Father. Your will be done in this place this morning. There's a purpose for your life, and it has nothing to do with your position. I know that better than anybody because I've been lost and broken but God's purposes for my life didn't change and some of you somebody here this morning I believe you're saying to yourself I believe God has a purpose for my life but I've messed it up I've broken his boundaries I've messed it up I've rejected him I've made so many mistakes God can't use somebody like me. That is a lie. God wants to use you. Your purpose outweighs your position. Other people can affect your position. They can tell you, you shouldn't be doing that. What are you doing? You're not even good at that. They'll try and tear you down, but they can never affect your purpose because your purpose comes straight from God. Father, right now, God, I'm believing you're releasing purpose in this place, God. No matter what family we came from, no matter what mistakes we've made, God, if we lay our lives down as a living sacrifice, there is still a destination with our name on it. There is a purpose and a calling. There is people that need to hear about you, and you're going to use us, God. You're going to use us in some way. We're going to use our passports for you, God. We're not going to buy the lie anymore that we're not good enough, that we've fallen too far away, or that you created us without purpose. You don't do that. Everything you do is on purpose. Everything you made is on purpose. Everything you said is on purpose, God. I'm asking for you to release purpose in this place this morning as we fight to do your will. In Jesus' name, will you worship him with me for a couple minutes?